You've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it. But you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Now, our guest for this week's show is a real estate expert, Ari Rastigar. Now, Ari is the founder and CEO of Rastigar Property Company. He has earned a reputation as a thought leader in real estate with his innovative, technology driven investment strategies. He specializes in recession-resilient real estate assets and multifamily real estate developments, building portfolios designed to reduce risk and maximize capital appreciation potential. Now, Ari is also a frequent contributor to popular publications like the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, CBS, and International Business Times. He started his first real estate investment company in 2006 while still in law school at St. Mary's University. He completed his undergraduate work at Texas A&M University. Now, here's what you're going to learn in our interview with Ari today. You're going to learn the various market fundamentals that attracted Ari to the Texas market, where he ultimately built his real estate investment firm. You'll learn how he got his start in residential building space prior to the 2008 financial crisis. You'll learn why he's attracted to vintage multifamily properties and how he goes about adding value to these older buildings. You can learn about how he managed the transition from working in the Wall Street institutional world, New York, and getting back to the entrepreneurial world and starting his own investment firm. You can learn about his strategy behind acquiring and land banking nearly 250 acres of premium located land in 2019 and what his long-term strategy is. You can learn why Ari has decided against investing in Houston and only focuses his energy on the Dallas market, San Antonio, and Austin markets. You can learn why Ari is bullish on the short-term high-end furnished housing sector, along with details on an iconic project in Dallas where he recently entered into a 10-year master lease agreement with industry leader Sonder. You're also going to learn about Ari's strict health regimen and why he attributes a lot of his success to his healthy lifestyle that he and his family abide by, and much, much more. So with that, guys, I'm super excited to get on to the show with Ari. But before we do, just have a few quick housekeeping items. First and foremost, I just want to do a check-in with you. How have you been holding up during these uncertain times that we find ourselves in? And how are you using this time to not only survive, but thrive during all this uncertainty, right? There's so much craziness going on in this world. And I'm going to give you a couple of pieces of advice. My first piece of advice would be to turn off the TV. I know it's staring at you. You know that Netflix just came out with a couple new series or new seasons of series and and it's just, uh, you're, you're aching to get over and watch them and binge watch them and, and you know, get stuck on the couch or in bed for you know, hours upon hours at a time. Don't do it, okay? In addition to that, stop watching the news and try and steer clear of uh, anything that has to do with CNN or Fox, what have you. Just stop watching the news. Maybe get on your iPhone and you know, download a news app and get the highlights of the day or from the prior day. Read it in the morning. Spend 10 minutes on it and that's it. Turn it off for the remainder of the day. It's not healthy and it's not going to help you at all. These are by far the two worst things that you could be doing at this present time. Instead, I'm going to challenge you. And that challenge is going to be to go pick up a book if that's not normal for you, right? Maybe you're an avid book reader. If you're not, pick up a book. Dive into a book. It doesn't have to be business or self-development related. It could just be a... Uh, a fiction book, a science fiction book, what have you. Uh, anything that you enjoy, but pick up a book and turn off that TV. Maybe spend more time with your family. Get outside and exercise. Even though there's social distancing, you can still get out and exercise uh, solo or, or with your family. You know, you can, we go out and do bike rides most, multiple times a day with our family, my wife and my two boys, okay? So uh, I get out and exercise. Even if you're in a cold climate, dress up for it, okay? Maybe start a new business, Right in times like we find ourselves in today, there's opportunity. There's opportunity to fill a void that might not have existed prior to this pandemic. And so how can you go about actually building a new business, starting a business during these challenging times? Maybe eat healthier, right? Start eat, eating healthier. If, if you know, Everyone's always talking about dieting, what have you, but maybe day, today's the day to act on that 
you know, plan that you've had in, you know, that you've had in the back of your mind for the last couple of weeks, months, or years of, I want to start eating healthier. Well, start it today. Maybe try and go on a juice fast for the next seven days and see how you feel after that, okay? Some of these might be extreme to you, but you got to start somewhere. And I want you to change it up. I want you to get out of your comfort zone. I want you to change things up. And again, those two things I don't want you doing is watching the news and also binging on Netflix or one of the many other subscription uh, uh, channels that are out there. Bottom line, now isn't the time to stop challenging yourself, okay? In fact, I believe that these are the times that you need to be pushing the limits and getting out of your comfort zone. Control the things that you can and don't worry about the rest. In fact, this is the attitude that helped me rebuild after losing everything in the 2008 financial crisis. The two things that I had control of at that point in time was my health and my mind. That's it. I didn't have control over anything else whatsoever. And so with that, I got in the best shape of my life by embracing a daily exercise routine as well as a mostly plant-based eating plan. I had more energy and mental clarity than I knew what to do with. I'm serious. And guess what? This gave me the energy and the focus to not only get through those really tough years following the 2008 crash, because when I crashed, it wasn't a crash and burn and back up on the saddle again. It was a crash and burn that lasted a number of years. I had a very challenging couple of years following that 2008 financial crisis. Uh, but I got back up on the horse and I rebuilt my business into something far greater than what I had previously lost. And that's where I'm at today. Okay. And so again, I challenge you to get out of your comfort zone and start focusing on you. Get healthy, get clarity, get energy so that you can thrive during these challenging times that we're facing today. So without sounding like a broken record, guys, my challenge to you is this. What are you doing today that will help you become a better you tomorrow? This is the time, people. Your family and your loved ones are counting on you. So step up, get uncomfortable, and make some big things happen. And just know that I love you all, and I wish you nothing but massive wealth and health now and always. Moving on here, guys. Over the last couple of episodes, you've heard how excited my team and I are about the new asset class that we'll be adding to our mobile home park portfolio. And that asset is parking. More specifically, parking lots and parking garages in strategic, highly desirable locations. Now, my partner and I just wrapped up writing an ebook which goes into detail of the many reasons we are so bullish on parking investments and we're making it available for free to all my listeners. Okay, so that means you to grab your free copy of Parking Lot Profits, the top 10 reasons parking investments generate cash flow and legacy wealth, you can text the word parking lot to 31996. Again, text the word parking lot to 31996. And be sure to type it as all one word, no spaces. Okay, parking lot, all one word, no spaces. And I also provide a link to the free copy in the show notes. Now, as previously mentioned on some other shows, we've been studying this sector behind the scenes for nearly two years now, and I can honestly say that we are equally as excited about parking as we were and still are today about mobile home parks. And just like we were with mobile home parks, our firm tends to be a few steps ahead of the popular trends. When we started buying parks eight years ago, we were part of only a small number who actually considered this to be a viable investment vehicle. Now, fast forward to today. Mobile home parks have attracted the masses, including private equity and institutional investors, okay? It's no longer a secret. And for a litany of reasons, which you will find detailed in our ebook, we feel that parking offers a similar opportunity. And while we feel that we're ahead of the curve, but I promise you, that won't last forever. Anyway, go grab a copy and you can make that determination for yourself whether or not you think parking is a good investment vehicle. And so now, guys, let's get on to the part of the show that you have been waiting for, which is our interview with Ari Rastigar. So here we go. Alrighty, guys, it is my honor to introduce my guest for today's show, real estate investment expert and founder and CEO of Rastigar Property Company, Ari Rastigar. Ari, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm great, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, thanks for joining us here. Very much, I was looking forward to the show. I spent a good deal of time um, reading about all, all of your successes that you've had over the years, Ari, uh, just making a lot of things happen uh, in, in numerous different markets, uh, more specifically in, in three primary Texas markets. Uh, your firm is based out of Austin. However, you guys uh, do a lot of business in Austin, San Antonio, and the DFW area, uh, in addition to a few other markets, I believe, in a few other states. And so, very much looking forward to Really taking a deep dive into you, your background, uh, the founding of uh, Rastigar Property Company, 
what your guys' focus is today. You've got some kind of iconic projects that you have in the works right now. Very excited to chat about those as well. And so before we get uh, deep into it, maybe if you could uh, take a few minutes and, and for those listeners that aren't familiar with you and your story, give us a little bit of a background of yourself, you know, and ultimately how you got into the real estate space. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, we're we're born. Uh, we're based in Austin, Texas, where I was born, actually. And you know, I come from from the mindset that you should, you know, invest in the areas you know that you know and really do you know that where you know. And so, after spending um, you know many years on Wall Street, you know, my wife and I decided that you know we wanted to really raise our kids in Austin. And so understanding where the markets were going, um, that was kind of the main impetus to leave from Manhattan and, and come back to Austin, because uh, it was really the marriage of, you know, of business and family, uh, which is also kind of the genesis of Rastigar. So if you walk through the hallways, you know, the firm, you'll see, you know, my sister-in-law, who is VP of operations, running construction, you know, my wife working in property management, uh, one of my best friends from college working on investment sales as a licensed real estate broker, you know, my chief of staff is my friend's at elementary school, you know, so very much what we do at Rastcar is, uh, is very much the, you know, the, 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 the combination of, um, a business, you know, and a personal life. And so when I spun off and started my own shop about five years ago, um, you know, that's really what it was about. It was about, you know, putting our name on the wall and, you know, Kelly and I doing something, uh, for our children. And we saw a huge opportunity in Austin, obviously Texas is, um, you know, what the, the local and state government have done a tremendous job of uh, creating a sociopolitical environment that, you know, is attracting, you know, developers, businesses, companies. Um, if you look at Austin, you're seeing, you know, the likes of Google and Facebook, um, Amazon's largest acquisition and Whole Foods, Oracle, um, you know, just to name a few that are really putting their flag down. Um, Apple, of course, building a billion dollar development you know, in North Austin. So we saw it as a, as a tremendous opportunity uh, to be able to, you know, do life, um, do life in Austin. And when we started the firm, um, we had some, you know, very, very, you know, high powered relationships uh, at some of the large asset managers, public pension funds, family offices, um, and other sponsors. So, you know, we opened and closed three funds and the impetus was to create, you know, income opportunities um, in a diversified portfolio for public public pension funds and family offices and other high net worth individuals. Um, and after doing that for, for many, many years, you know, we, we saw the opportunity to uh, go back to doing what I do best, which is really being an owner operator. Um, I started the firm when I was in, uh, or started my first real estate investment firm, I should say, when I was in law school, my first year of law school. Um, after kind of delivering pizzas through, uh, through Texas A&M and uh, saving up a little bit of money and pulling together my scholarship money and uh, a small loan from a friend, um, I started being, building a little kind of single family homes um, outside of San Antonio. And um, after a few years, we had built a pretty decent portfolio, um, certainly a decent portfolio for a kid that, you know, kind of didn't, didn't grow up with too much. Um, and then 2008 happened. Right. So I uh, kind of walked away with good credit and um, sold everything to my partner who had the liquidity, who, you know, many years later actually ended up doing very, very well with the portfolio we aggregated, um, you know, and then made it to New York and kind of came full circle and um, came back to Texas where, you know, our focus is, you know, from an acquisition standpoint, you know, more opportunistic. Um, and I mean that by saying, you know, if we find, you know, some situational distress opportunities, uh, we find, you know, great covered land plays. Um, the bulk of our investments are, you know, vintage multifamily in Austin um, that we just buy, you know, kind of older product and very, very well located uh, areas that we can do uh, interior and exterior finish outs, um, you know, get, you know, rent increases in year one, anywhere from 18 to 30 um, percent on more smaller middle market type products you know, anywhere ranging from 4 million to 35, 40 million on the acquisition side um, and owner operate them ourselves. Um, and as we sell them, refinance them, um, we've historically used balance sheet uh, to continue buying, um, you know, very well located land, assembling larger lots uh, from kind of, you know, anchor locations as we've done on South First, on South Congress. Um, we bought 200 acres in Kyle, which is just south of Austin um, and kind of just north of San Antonio on the I-35 corridor. Um, 
and we run two approaches. You know, we have a kind of a near-term approach um, in our kind of vintage multifamily that's a year, 18-month, two-year kind of horizon uh, for an exit or a recap. Um, and then we kind of use our proceeds and use our kind of internal expertise uh, to get, um, you know, get land shovel ready. Um, and, you know, that's kind of what we've done in a nutshell, although we have invested in over 30 cities, 12 states, um, in seven different asset classes. Uh, we let the market kind of dictate where we see, you know, kind of the safest risk-adjusted uh, returns. Um, in recent years, we've seen that mostly in, you know, vintage multifamily. Got it. Got it. I appreciate that background. I want to back up a little bit and I want to talk about uh, kind of the, uh, uh, the foundationary period of, of uh, uh, Ragastar and when you guys started and, you know, your tr- really the transition, what that looked like from Wall Street, you know, leaving New York, leaving the institutional side of things and, uh, um, and, and starting your own firm, getting back into the owner operator side of things. I mean, just generally speaking, what did that transition look like? Uh, was it scary? I mean, you're talking two different worlds, although you knew both worlds, right? Like you had, you had a, a, a good um, feeler already. You were already involved in, in the private side prior to going institutional. But what did that look like shifting back over to the owner operator side? Um, aside from pure and utter terror. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, no, it was, um, look, it was, it was, it was very scary, you know, to tell the truth because, you know, I was, you know, kind of having a little bit of an identity crisis, you know, learning mm-hmm. what it means to be a husband, um, learning what it means to be a father. Um, Kelly and I now have uh, three beautiful children. Um, our youngest is only three months old. Our oldest is seven. Um, and so, you know, that, that was the main, um, more, the main struggle for us is figuring out, you know, how do we be entrepreneurs? Uh, Kelly in a, in a previous life was Johnny Depp's um, executive flight attendant. And, wow. you know, really... Yeah, it was a. It sounds a little more glamorous than, uh, than it was. <laughs> yeah. Um, the wonderful man, you know, wonderful people, wonderful family, um, you know, and so tr- trying to figure out, okay, having kind of the, you know, the steady paycheck, and you know, us going there, creating value, and doing it under someone else's banner, but you know, we had that moment where we had to decide, you know. Um, you know, how do we want to run our company? You know, what are our core values are going to be? You know, what are, you know, what can we learn, you know, from, from the past? You know, how can we stand on the shoulders of giants of um, mm-hmm. some of the great members, um that I've worked with, but, you know, really finding a different way um, or, you know, really what we believe to be, you know, a better way of, um, of doing these things. Were you able to carry over some of the uh, the relationships, the institutional relationships that you had from Wall Street over to, um, uh, to, to your current company, uh, or I guess it really the question derives from, you know, where, where does a majority of the funding come from? I mean, we put the, we, we've got multiple funds, but you know, we're typically just only dealing with high net worth accredited individuals. I'm assuming some of your funding comes from that side or some of the equity, but, uh, do you also tap into those prior relationships that you leverage from wall street? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we've maintained phenomenal relationships, um, you know, with, Previous employers, previous relationships, vendors, investors, bankers. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what a lot has allowed us to have, you know, the growth, um, you know, that we have. I mean, in 2019, you know, being that the bulk of what we did was land, you know, we bought over 250 acres um, wow. in, the, in, in the wider Austin MSA. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can imagine what that looks like on top of um, acquisition of, um, you know, numerous multifamily projects. You know, the land that we bought in downtown Phoenix is in the Opportunity Zone. And quite frankly, being able to make, you know, that many acquisitions that are strategic, um, that have deep value, that have long-term accretive value, um, you know, it, t- it, takes, it takes a village. And it takes a village on the banking side, on the investment side. Um, the vast majority of our equity across kind of the, you know, the rest of our global funds um, is public pension funds, is institutional capital. Um, okay. And by a wide, wide percentage. Um, but with that, we have a you know, you know, large family office in Dallas. It's done a lot of work with us for many, many years. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, we started the business with accredited investors. You know, doing the fifties and the hundreds and the two fifties. And um, I'm you know really delighted and proud that you know we've been able to continue to create them value and uh, have mm-hmm. them stay with us for many years. And so, in terms of numbers of investors, you know, you know clearly it's the high net worth. But in terms of dollars, it's um, it's institutional and, um, yep. you know, it's 
great for them because they get to kind of ride on the coattails a little bit of the institutional uh, protocols, the institutional mm-hmm. uh, risk management, um, and get to kind of co-invest. And um, it's something that means a lot to Kelly and I to be able to, you know, still do that work for the people that helped us very, very early on, um, even yep. though that the uh, the investment dollars have um, have grown substantially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great, great. So uh, bullish on Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, and San Antonio. How about Houston, th- th- that big old city that that's left out of that equation? Uh, have you well, guys? I, you know, I don't like to say the H word. I, I don't. I don't like to say the H word very often. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just joking. Um, Houston. A, a lot of guys smarter than me have made a ton of money in um, made a ton of money down in Houston, and uh, it's it's just not a market that I know. Cause like I said, I grew up on that I 35 corridor. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've been looking heavily in San Antonio for many, many years. Obviously I went to, you know, went to law school there at St. Mary's university and started my yep. first in, uh, development company north of San Antonio. Uh, today we've been looking at a bunch of deals down there, but we haven't pulled the trigger on anything, um, in recent years. Although I am super bullish on it from a population growth standpoint, uh, job market, great healthcare employment. Um, Obviously, Austin speaks for itself. Super, super bullish on Dallas um, and the sprawled Metroplex. Uh, we're watching, you know, the little submarkets grow exponentially, such as McKinney, Texas, Frisco. Um, there's just so much opportunity. I mean, you have large companies such as Uber that are now putting down their flag um, in Debellum, um, just outside of downtown. Obviously, we have a seminal work um, going up at 1899 McKinney Avenue um, in Dallas, which which is right just outside of uptown across from the Clyde Warren park, you know, two blocks from the Ritz Carlton. Um, and we are, you know, we're really fortunate to partner with, uh, the billion dollar, um, company out of San Francisco called Sonder. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. So Sonder is a little background on them in case some of your listeners don't know. Um, they are backed by Jeff Bezos. Uh, they're backed by some of the, you know, smartest, smartest groups on Wall Street. They recently hired one of the uh, the ex CEO of Starwood Hotels to be uh, part of their board, and really they've become, you know, the the number one hospitality disruptor in the world. And what I love about what they've done is they're great real estate people. They understand the dirt, and they started the company by going to, you know, pre existing apartment buildings that had vacancies of call it five five units, ten units, twenty units, whatever it is, and they go in there and bring kind of institutional protocols, almost think of them like a institutional Airbnb. So although what they do is, you know, kind of flexible accommodations, you know, some folks try to call it short term rental, but that's really not what it is. Um, And they spend more money on the interior, putting great beds, great sheets, great interiors, um, having the right uh, materials in the kitchen, um, that they create this wonderful experience for the end user because they figured out that the end user is really living in the room while they're there. And their average mm-hmm. user is there from three to 30 days. Um, so instead of spending all this extra money on a, on a lobby or uh, staffing and all these other things that uh, aren't being used as much, they put their dollars to the interior. So partnering you know, with Rastigar um, on this 1899 project you know, allows them to have you know, co-naming rights with us um, so they can really have a flagship seminal location um, you know, it's uh, they're not making any more McKinney Avenue, uh, Michigan Avenue, Park Avenues, and so it's a very exciting project to do. They'll be have they'll be master leasing, or they have master leased uh, the entire building, um, which will start um, in delivery of the building, and uh, will be a will be a great project. Uh, the initial term is ten years. Um, which will be uh, which will be great for them and and great for us. But we've really really enjoyed you know working with them and um, you know from a Dallas hospitality standpoint, I mean there is such a demand for hospitality in this area that it's um, it'll be very exciting for the city. Is this the first project where they've come and actually master leased an entire property? This is the largest. Um, this is the largest um, master lease that they've ever done. They're actually working on um, on a couple more now, and you know they're really a, a global company. I mean, they're in Dubai, they're in Italy, um, they've expanded all over the world. But at the time that we did this deal um, a few months ago, this was you know the largest um, flexible accommodation deal ever done in the world. Certainly the biggest one they ever did, and as far as we know, it's the biggest one that was ever done. Um, which is uh, pretty exciting. Yeah. So, you know, just speaking to that business model, Sandra, obviously, you know, brilliant minds behind it, you know, billion dollar company. Uh, but obviously there's, there, there's some risk associated, um, you know, with that particular industry. I mean, it's very much a disruptor and it's a disruptor to the 
traditional hospitality space, right? Of, of, of normal traditional hotels. And I know that the hotel industry has been pushing a back, you know, back against it aggressively over the years. There's been even some markets that have, um, you know, uh, proceeded with regulatory changes to uh, how short-term rentals or flexible housing uh, are classified and, you know, trying to eliminate them for certain markets, what have you. Is there any long-term risk or even short-term risk associated with their business model and, you know, kind of them being the master tenant of your entire project? Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, we, we're risk managers for a living. I think everything has yeah. risk, right? I mean, walking across mm-hmm. the street has risk. Um, you know, certainly, you know, with this market, um, there, there is. I mean, there's been some regulatory changes. We, we feel like, you know, from a risk-adjusted return standpoint, Dallas has been very amenable, um, you know, to this business model. And obviously, a lot of people push back on Airbnb, and now it's a multi-billion dollar company all over the world. And, you know, we're of the mindset that, you know, disruption can be, you know, kind of, you know, stopped or slowed down, but real disruption that's causing real innovation, that's really helping the end user, you know, can't be stopped for long. And I think, you know, Saunders really showed that um, in a very meaningful way. Um, For us, you know, the great part about a location like 1899 McKinney um, is there's so much flexibility. I mean, you know, from a multifamily standpoint, you're looking at some of the highest occupancy rates, the highest prices per foot um, of any corridor in the state of Texas. You know, so if something were to happen there, we're very, very confident um, that, you know, you could run it as traditional multifamily, right? And you would lease it up, that you'd get the rates you'd want, and, um, you know, it would kind of get you get you where you want to get uh, one way or another. Obviously, you know, we prefer this route, um, but we have those safeguards in place, and we've run, you know, all those sensitivity analyses uh, to be more than prepared um, if it doesn't work out exactly how we plan, just like we do on um, any investment we make. In, in that scenario, maybe you can't go into detail with what that master le- lease agreement might look look like, all the intricacies. But I mean, is it generally speaking, is it uh, more than likely a triple net type arrangement to where they're basically just coming in and managing every aspect of that of that property uh, once it's completed, or is it a variation of that? Yeah, so so it's a hybrid. Um, it's a hybrid. It's not it's not exactly a true triple net lease. Um, and yes, there is definitely parts of the building they are managing, they are maintaining, um, as well as parts that, you know, we are, um, so it's really a partnership, you know, Mm -hmm. um, more than anything. And being that this type of, you know, lease, you know, for multifamily buildings has never really existed. It's really been a learning process, you know, for both of us and something that we've educated our bankers on. And, um, there's nothing about it that's been normal or cookie cutter, right? It's been, you know, (laughs) a lot of collaboration. And um, a lot of back and forth, but the good part is the sentiment and the heart value that's been behind the entire project has been so positive um, and something that we've all been really excited about. So when you have that type of mentality and you have that type of sentiment um, in the face of, you know, kind of larger potential issues, it makes it a lot easier to, to navigate them when everybody has the same collective end goal. Yeah, no, absolutely. You're, you're an innovator and a pioneer, man. I love it. I love it. So per your website, I, I read on there that you know, the three different asset classes that, um, that you guys kind of uh, specialize in, self-storage, multifamily, discount retail. You had mentioned that, you know, you, you put a significant emphasis on, you know, vintage multifamily, uh, especially in the Austin markets. Obviously, you've got this new project going, going up as well that we just spoke about. G- give me an idea, proportionally speaking, uh, you know, how much of your business is made up of, of the retail sector as well as self-storage? Is it, is it a very small portion? Yeah, well, at one point, right, right now, it's nothing. Um, right okay. now, we don't have anything in the self-storage space. At one point, we were co-invested in over 10,000 storage doors. And so we kind of, you know, on the past and some of these descriptions and self-storage was really good to us early on. Mm-hmm. Um, but just like anything else, you know, it started to get a little hot. And, you know, when the market starts to get a little hot in some direction, I usually pivot and go the other direction. Mm-hmm. Um, same with retail. Um, you know, the retail that we own in Austin is more, you know, covered land play. Um, type type situations. We have a um, we have a retail location up on I thirty five. It's a phenomenal piece of land that has uh, that has a, a bar in it right now. That's been there for many many years, and you know it allows us to kind of be there, them operate their business, and you know from a long term standpoint, and let us do all the work for a potential redevelopment in the future, right? Um, so we're not in the retail business by any stretch of the imagination, but um, our new yeah. development. 
um, namely on South First and South Congress, will have anywhere from 20 to 30,000 square feet of retail. Um, Austin, as you know, has broken every single record from retail. Um, I mean, there's some parts of Austin on South Congress that are signing leases at $100 triple net. Wow. Um, which is <laughs> That's an extraordinary crazy. number. It was the cover of the Austin Business Journal a few weeks ago. It's actually in a building called Music Lane that's going to house um, Soho House, Equinox. Um, it's uh, pretty remarkable. But, you know, retail and uh, retail and self-storage are definitely a thing of the past for us. When we were in retail, uh, we did mostly discount retail, um, such as, you know, Ross, TJ Maxx, uh, Target, Anchored Products um, that did really, really well. And um, obviously there's a lot of disruption um, in that sector since the um, advent of Amazon. But, you know, believe it or not, I think that there's definitely a home for retail. Um, mm-hmm. When you look at multiples, um, you know, from a core value standpoint, they're really looking for, you know, for an experiential, um, you know, type experience, right? Going to retail, seeing things, getting to touch and feel them. Um, so I actually believe long term there was a very big overcorrection uh, into retail, and I think some of it needs to be reinvented. We're actually actually starting to see, um, which I talked about many years ago, was big box uh, retail, such as old Sears, um, are being converted mm-hmm. into self storage, which is um, pretty interesting. Watching that, you know, kind of disruption, or watching you know one you know type of asset class phase out and being reinvented. Um, but we're, um, like I said, we're, we're looking for anything opportunistic and if we're going through, you know, going down that road, um, you know, definitely it's from a covered la- uh, land place standpoint, and even a mm-hmm. lot of the multifamily, you know, now, you know, we push towards rezoning or finding some variances or buying a multifamily that has accretive zoning that, you know, once we yield out of the property, we can have a, a redevelopment or a new ground up development in the future. You know, so we're always looking for multiple different scenarios, um, and having real flexibility and agility because, you know, what I believe has got us here um, is just that, is, is being agile, is being flexible, um, and mm-hmm. we're some of the large institutions that have been behind us or worked with us, whether on the banking or the equity side, you know, they've seen that and um, been able to create for them, you know, you know, more security than, you know, some of the other bigger shops and um, same on the banking side. Yep, got it, got it. And uh, you made a mention earlier about you know uh, just a significant amount of uh, uh, raw land that you guys had purchased over the last uh, year or so. I think you know two hundred plus acres. Um, the intent is to get it to you know shovel ready. Is it after it gets shovel ready? Is it your intent to actually continue forward with a with a development, or do you guys typically sell off shovel ready land? Is that part of the investment strategy? We're fully horizontally and vertically integrated. I mean, on okay. one of the big. We have um, and Kyle, as I mentioned, we hired Corgan, who's the you know world famous architecture firm, to do a master plan for us. Mm-hmm. Um, they'll probably be doing a municipal bond offering, you know, for infrastructure. You know, we're working very very closely with the city of Kyle to really understand you know what their needs are, what they're looking to accomplish, and you know the good part is. Um, you know, it's, um, there's not as much bureaucracy as Rastigar, right? At the corporate level, you know, we own 100% of the firm. Um, so we're able to make, you know, those, you know, those really creative out of the box decisions uh, for long term. So like I said, for Kelly and I, the, all this stuff is for our kids and um, just going and, you know, selling something for the sake of selling something is not, um, you know, it's not really in the cards for us. So we plan mm-hmm. on be shovel ready and develop, developing them, um, certainly finding um, strategic um, development partners um, that have, you know, the experience of doing this um, mm-hmm. is definitely in the cards for us. But um, all these things were bought, purchased uh, to take out of the ground and uh, see them all the way through. Got it. Got it. I, pre- I appreciate that. So I want to pivot a little bit here as we move uh, you know, towards uh, the, you know, the end of the show. Five years ago, you know, when you started Rastigar, you know, other than your wife, Kelly, what was the, you know, the, some of the next key hires that allowed you to get from basically startup to you know, on a, really, a real growth trajectory of where you guys are at today? Like, who were those first couple of key hires in your organization? Yeah, no, that's um, that's a great question. So um, certainly my chief of staff, Major Miller, who's been my friend since we were little kids, 
um, you know, and various things that we've done since we were little, different businesses, um, just different endeavors. You know, he's always been really the backbone of helping me keep everything organized um, and having him there to really run back office and help get everything started was mission critical. Um, you know, really bringing on our third party fund advisor, uh, fund administrator was a, was a, was a key point from a risk management standpoint and really, you know, from really running the backbone of the business was crucial. Um, mm -hmm. and so the team is industry, industry fund technologies. They're based out of South Florida. Um, they came in and brought in all the, you know, all the back office accounting, you know, all the in, you know, in-house, um, compliance issues, um, re institutional reporting, working with the auditors, um, and really bringing their full back office to, you know, really bring us the risk controls and the management of a much larger company than we were. And that really helped us scale um, in a very meaningful way. Yeah, no, that, that's fantastic. Now we've, we, we, and we do not use a fund administrator there. However, I'm familiar with, with that group and there's a number of others as well in that space. So that's, um, that's, that's very interesting. So you guys basically brought them in right from the get go, pretty much from the get go, correct? We did. It was, um, it was really when we were doing one-off deals in the first six months, co-investing mm -hmm. with other sponsors. And yeah. um, when we decided to launch our first fund about six months into inception, um, having those safeguards in place were mandatory. So as we were you know, forming our first fund, we brought them in uh, to manage the back office. And shortly after, you know, the pension fund out of Louisiana put a million dollars into our fund. And, you know, from there, you know, having the audits and, you yeah. know, having all of those safeguards were mandatory for them. So it was perfect timing. So to bring them in, yeah. you know, have all that risk management in place. And then from there, we scaled up and closed our first fund and then did our second and then did a value fund, um, you know, and um, moved it on from there. Yeah, fantastic. Well, let's let's move on here. I'd like to go to what I call the lightning round, Ari. And this is where I'm going to ask you six questions, up somewhat personal questions, so we can get to know you a little bit better. Uh, and looking for six short, concise answers. Uh, the first one: your biggest fear. What is it? Um, my biggest fear is you know not finishing all my work. You know, knowing that you know we've been given the opportunity uh, to be good stewards and to build build something bigger than us, and you know really you know build something for our children, as I've mentioned many times, and. My biggest fear is not having enough time to uh, to build it all the way that you know the way that we see it and um, the way that we feel is our destiny to do so. Yeah, I love it. I'm going to switch up the order of these questions now because the next one follows right in line with that. Is outside of the daily, daily work grind, what do you do to decompress? Um, health management. So I have a okay. um, I have an age management doctor, and as uh, you read more about me, you can see GQ did a big feature on me, kind of explaining. Um, my health regimen. And so for me, that's really another full-time job is where I, um, you know, eat a certain way, I have full hormone replacement, pharmaceutical grade vitamins, uh, exercise regimen, posture management, transcendental meditation, um, and a mm. whole slew of things that we do to maintain equanimity and maintain sound body um, and spirit so that when I show up to work, um, I, I can come with, you know, with my full self. No, I love that. I, I did not dig around enough to find that, but I surely will after the uh, the show here. <laughs> That's very intriguing. Uh, how about your one biggest regret? What is it? Um, you know, there's. Um, I've come to realize in my life that life wasn't happening to me. Life was happening for me all along. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I once would have thought, um, you know, was a regret really wasn't. But I think in hindsight, I think I would have started my firm a little bit sooner um, than I did. But with that said, there's so many things that I learned, um, along the pathway, um, right. that I wouldn't change for anything. So, um, I'd like to believe that I live a life, uh, without regret. Um, and I'm, you know, I love it. Grateful. Grateful would be the understatement of the century for what we're able to do today. No, it's, it's very interesting because that, that, that question gets asked, and I would tell you that the most brilliant folks that I've met over these years of, of doing the show uh, have zero regrets. So very much in line with uh, what I know about you. So that's, that's a perfect answer. How about the most influential business book or just general book? doesn't necessarily have to be a business book. Uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Yeah, that's a wonderful one, a classic. How about the one thing that you can't live without? Uh, my family, my wife and my kids. Yeah. And then lastly here, if you woke up one day and just decided that you no longer wanted to be in the, uh, the real estate space, uh, you know, Rastigar, you know, you feel like it's kind of run its course and you had fun. It was lucrative. You've helped a lot of people. You've enjoyed the ride, but um, you're ready to make a pivot and, uh, and, and do something else. 
where were your time be focused at that point? Rastigar Studios would be the, um, the movie industry. I go to Hollywood. Please elaborate. That, that, that's the complete opposite answer. Well, I, actually, I didn't know what the answer was going to be, but uh, tell me about that life and uh, uh, you know, what that vision looks like. Yeah, I mean, my wife, my wife comes from a Hollywood background. Um, uh-huh. I'm an English major by trade. I've been a writer, you know, my whole life. And uh, for fun, you know, we, we watch great movies. Kelly's been on the inside and the outside of making, you know, blockbuster, multi-billion dollar movies. And uh, that's what we do for fun. We, we read old okay. scripts. You know, um, everybody in our family, um, you know, my dad's side of the family, Kelly's side of the family have either been singers or uh, act, nothing professional, nothing serious other than my stepdad that's the dean of theater arts at Texas State University. But we just love entertainment. We love, I know our daughter has become a tremendous singer and a musician. You know, Kelly had done dance and singing her whole life. You know, I've, I'm a book nerd uh, where I just read and write, you know, anytime that I have spare. So it's something as a family that we do that we all really enjoy um, and, you know, it would be something that, you know, down the road, other than the philanthropic things that we do with Rest of Our Family Foundation, um, which I believe is really going to be the next phase of my life, truly, um, once Rastigar is where it is over the next 10 years, um, but something that I would do on a business side that I think we'd have just as much fun doing um, is going to Hollywood. Yeah, fantastic. That, that's great. And I appreciate you sharing that with us. And lastly, uh, Ari, you know, what one final gold nugget of advice or wisdom? I mean, you've given us a bunch already, but what one final gold nugget of advice or wisdom what could you leave with our listeners today that may inspire and motivate them as they progress in their very own real estate investing career? Yeah, I, I think it's just get started. And yeah. I think a lot of times we spend you know, a lot of time. And look, there's always a place for planning. There's always a place for being strategic. Um, but there's nothing like action and there's nothing like boldness. And, Mm -hmm. um, an old mentor of mine would say, you know, there's nothing, no mistake you can make from being bold that can't be fixed with being even more bold. Mm, I love that. And I think this is a time that boldness is needed. Um, so the younger, um, younger minds or some of the, you know, maybe older seasoned minds that think it's not, you know, they don't have any time left or some of the older ones, the younger ones that think that they need to spend more time. If you have that, you know, feeling in your gut that there's something there that you need to create, it's bigger than you. You know, this is something that the world needs, it's something that, um, mm-hmm. that the people you're going to contribute to, they need, they need you to be your best self. Um, so when you make that bold decision to go out, you know, on your own, bringing in strategic partners, forming a mastermind alliance, you know, reading great books, um, all I can do is push you to do it sooner, faster, quicker, um, and with more boldness and more confidence. Because in my in my experience, the universe conspires. Um, to help those that are bold um, accomplish their wildest dreams. I, I love that. I'm pretty sure that I'm just going to borrow your friend's quote regarding that and uh, put that on my wall. I, I love that, everything about it. Ari, right, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you coming to the show, taking the time out of your busy schedule. Uh, you know, folks, to learn more about Ari and, and uh, his firm and all the, the projects they have going on, you can go visit their website, which is rastagarproperty.com, and I'll be sure to put that in the show notes. You can also find him on LinkedIn. Lots of great articles that are attached to his LinkedIn profile. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, Ari, I'm going to do a little bit more research because during my initial research, I did not find anything out about um, your health regimen that, that you carry. And that's very intriguing. So very much looking forward to uh, learning more about you, my friend. Uh, so really appreciate you coming on the show. And folks, I appreciate you tuning into this week's episode. And until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin Bupp, wishing you huge success. You guys take care now. Congratulations. Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources, visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com and we'll see you next Monday morning.